wait for everybody to be quiet and pay you attention. So we are at that moment now, um, and it's my job to introduce the second session of the day, uh, which is on professional development. So my name is Helen Eccles, and I'm from Cambridge International Examinations. We work in over 160 different countries throughout the world, uh, and so I'm particularly interested in that sort of international aspects of maths education. And I should also, I also want to mention that I'm not a mathematician myself, chemistry is my subject, uh, and I think this maths framework is going to be something that will be really useful for people like myself, uh, because much like those of you that may know the um, CEFR, the um, Framework for European Languages, it'll have can-do statements in, which we'll be able to say quite clearly and articulate really um, uh, with emphasis uh, the sort of mathematics that students can do. We find employers sometimes come to us and other people saying that uh, students that have taken our qualifications don't have the right math skills. And when we ask them, well, what are the math skills that you want them to have, uh, it's very difficult for them to reply. So again, I'm hoping that the maths framework will be something that will enable people to sort of point and show us mm -hmm. so we can design much better syllabuses, specifications and assessments. So we're thinking about the professional development aspect uh, and we all know, all of us in this room, that there's um, a great synergy between professional development, the, the subject content itself uh, and the assessments. The assessments are, are, are going to be mapped to the domains as a kind of signposting so that that gives the framework and architecture uh, but we're thinking about the professional development right now, and I'd also like us to think of that in, in the same kind of architectural way. And we have two fantastic speakers uh, who almost don't need introducing to you as an audience, because I'm sure you know them very well. Um, and uh, Mike Askew is going to... <laughs> Mike Askew is going to talk first. Um, he uh, has been working in maths education uh, for an awful long time, <laughs> but I promise not to say how long. Uh, he had a chair of maths at King's College here in London and then left to go to be the adjunct professor of, professor of mathematics um, in Melbourne for five years, I think. And he's now back and he's got the best job title I've heard for a long time, which is uh, the Distinguished Professor of Mathematics Education at the University of Witz. So uh, on that note, can I just welcome back um, our international colleagues? Uh, so we still have Johannesburg and Cairo on the line. Uh, I'm particularly pleased, obviously, from coming from Cambridge International Examinations, to, uh, to, to have their input into the debate, uh, and I think they'll have some very interesting things to say. So our second speaker is Professor Malcolm Swan, um, who, now he did date his initial uh, um, beginning of his sort of maths education career, which he tells me is 1979, so he's been working since then on resourcing teachers to improve teaching. Um, we have a good split of the curriculum uh, in that Mike likes to think more about the primary and Malcolm more about secondary FE maths. So I'm hoping that between them both we'll be able to cover the whole end-to-end 5 to 19 process. Good. Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you, Lynn, and everybody for inviting me. And a word to my colleagues to be in uh, South Africa. I'm not sure where I should be looking if I'm talking to camera. Um, but um, in case you're wondering what a professor of Witz is doing here in the UK at the moment, and not in Johannesburg, is I'm actually taking up post there in a couple of months' time. So I haven't quite taken up that position yet, but I'm on, I'm on my way to it. And um, I'm Malcolm and I um, have talked about what we're going to what uh, we're going to try and raise. Um, I'm going to paint some fairly broad brushstroke issues um, and then Malcolm's going to talk 
in a bit more detail about professional development. Um, and I just want to, to frame um, the issues I want to raise, because um, when Lynn invited me to come and talk, I was, I was, I was delighted and pleased and, and excited to do so. Uh, when I got down to look at the details of what we've currently got to work with, it's difficult to start to think about what the actual implications for professional development will be. So I'm going to take this opportunity to say a few things about the framework as well as about uh, professional development. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I want to draw your attention to these two images of the fractal and, and, and the um, fern um, because it's kind of behind my thinking uh, these days. Um, they're archetypal images of, uh, as, you, as you will know, uh, complexity theory. And um, people like Brent Davis are writing about complexity theory in, in education um, and contrasting it with uh, complicated models of teaching and learning. And one of the things that's been going through my mind as I've been reading the documents and, and thinking and listening this morning is an invitation to Cambridge to start to think about where and if complexity theory has a place to play in this. There's been lots of talk about frameworks and pathways, and with all respect, Helen talked about architecture. And I think those metaphors about teaching and learning are very much lo located in a, in a model of teaching and learning, which is the complicated model, which is the engineering model, the archetypal uh, metaphor for which is clocks, that I can engineer a clock, I can make it work very precisely, I can adjust it so its timing works. Um, complexity theory is much more organic in its metaphors um, and much more about growth and emergence rather than engineering. And I think there's a tension here in pre presenting something that, that manages to capture both of those. And I think Margaret touched on how we might begin to explore that in this idea of, of zooming in. That, of course, the archetypal image in complexity theory is, is the, this image of self-similarity, that zooming in on part of the, of the fractal, zooming in on part of the fern, you're getting a replication of what the thing looks like from a distance. And I think some way of thinking about how we zoom in on, on these would be helpful. I want to raise some questions that came into my head as I was reading uh, the background information, which I think some of you have only had today, so probably haven't digested it to the same extent. But it, again, it, I'm inviting this as, a, as a, a space to think about some of the assumptions and some of the underlying claims that are being made about the way the framework is being developed. One of the statements in one of the papers is that internationally there's now a high degree of coherence across mathematics curricula. And I, I'm in line with what some commentators are now talking about, which is this question about, are international studies actually finding this coherence, or are they actually creating it? There are some people now who are arguing that Pisa and Tim's, rather than actually raising uh, the quality of mathematics for teaching and learning, are actually dumbing it down. Because what gets edited out is the variation, is the difference between nations. That, you know, what, what gets put in is the common stuff that people can agree, the interesting stuff that's on the fringes either gets, either gets ignored or, or withers. And so there's, there's a problem, I think, currently in the globalization and international studies that actually we end up with uh, a common core that is kind of, doesn't offend anybody, um, but maybe doesn't do the best for moving forward mathematics education into the 21st century. My second question is also the claim that uh, the framework is going to be evidence-based and that somehow makes it neutral. And, and my question here is whether or not any research can be neutral. But also how research is always going to be grounded in um, some assumptions that we have. And the example I want to use here is Jean Schmittau's work, who, uh, whose work probably isn't as widely known, I think, in the research community as, as I think it should be. But she argues very strongly that, um, and I, I'll be interested in what Sue Gifford's reaction to this is, that particularly in early years mathematics education, we've got it wrong by starting with counting. That actually if you build an early years curriculum around measuring, around uh, continuous quantities rather than discrete quantities, then uh, children's understanding of ratio and proportion and fractions is much stronger as it grows. And that the counting comes out of counting how you measure things rather than counting buttons and counters. And so um, is that a neutral piece of research? Because there's lots of assumptions about the order in which we teach things, which I think are just a consequence of common practice and stuff that's got bedded down over, over the years. Um, so um, I'm, I'm <coughs> questioning whether or not 
the evidence can be neutral in the sense of there's some truths that we can find about how we teach mathematics which are going to be universal. Um, and my third question is this, and, and as I've been listening to it, I'm still not quite sure about who the audience for this framework is. In, in thinking about, about the mathematics professional development uh, opportunities and questions. I, I, I kept coming back to saying, so I know the framework is going to be made publicly available, so in a sense it's everybody's and the audience is everyone, but actually in terms of thinking about professional development, who is this, who is this um, framework being directed towards? The other thing I want to question is a word that again has been bandied around all morning, and it's the word curriculum. Um, we, because we have a national curriculum now, I think we we, we think we know what a curriculum is. But I want to go back to the model of curriculum that Robert Eisen Dirks produced, I think, in the, in the late 1970s, where they distinguished uh, three possible interpretations of the curriculum, which was the intended curriculum, the, the kind of documents that many frameworks uh, present in terms of what a curriculum should look like. Um, there's the enacted curriculum of how those, those curriculum documents actually get played out in classrooms, what sense teachers make of those, and how, uh, how students uh, engage with those ideas as mediated by teaching and by teachers. And then the attained curriculum of, of what comes out at the end of it. What, what are we talking about, what we want <coughs> students to actually learn? If you look at England's new national curriculum, I think it's a, it's a model of all three now. You look at those statements of attainment, and some of them seem to be intentions, some of them seem to be advice to how you should be teaching now, and some of them seem to be statements of what students should be able to do. And so there's a kind of melding of these together now in this kind of hybrid curriculum. But I think it's actually worth keeping those separate and teasing them apart. And the flavor of, of what I've heard so far today and what I've read, I think, kind of ties in with a common view that you kind of start with the intended, you move into the enacted, which you somehow explore through professional development, and then you look at the attained at the end of that. Um, as I've been thinking about these three, I think a, a, more, a more useful way to think about them is this kind of vision of them being embedded one within the other, that you can't actually, there isn't a separate intended curriculum from a separate an acted curriculum from a separate attained curriculum. Because, because the intended curriculum, whatever the document looks like, whatever the frameworks that people produce look like, has to be enacted for it to come to life, and it has to be learnt in some sense. And so where do we put our, our attention? If you look at professional development and how professional development plays out, then I think um, certainly in... Um, if you, if you go back some years, there, there was a kind of emphasis that the way to improve uh, teaching is to get the intended curriculum right, train teachers, sorry, educate teachers in uh, the use of, of the intentions. And the national numeracy strategy, I think, was fairly, although it had lots of support in classrooms, was fairly focused on that intended curriculum and went from being a fairly slim document to the death by a thousand objectives that it turned out to be uh, as, it, as it progressed and developed. Um, and as Margaret pointed out, there's a difficulty with putting your focus on the intended, which is the more detailed you get, uh, the, more, the, the more cumbersome it becomes, and the more the danger is it becomes fragmented because you end up teaching to the separate parts of it. So there's lots of professional development which moves to looking at teaching, to, to working on pedagogy. Um, and uh, how it's enacted, looking back to the intended curriculum and how that's interpreted, and looking out to the attained <coughs> curriculum and what students are, 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 are meant to learn. And I think there's a place for that, and we know that as far as professional development is concerned, that probably the most, and I know Malcolm's going to talk more about this, but in terms of changing actual pedagogic practices, um, it's um, things like co-coaching, going and watching each other teach, um, and being engaged in developing practices together that actually makes a big difference there. And I think one of, of course, the challenges then to something like the Cambridge Framework is how do you do that in what is going to be a virtual online environment? Um, there may well be potential to have uh, on-the-ground work in, in various places, but 
who knows how that'll, how, how that'll pan out. But I think we're now in a space where, certainly as far as primary mathematics is concerned, and I think to, maybe to a lesser extent in secondary, but I think it's still there, and it was a bit touched on this morning, which is that we need to really shift the focus on what it is we actually want students to attain, that, that we know that the interpretation of the intentions, as it gets mediated through into the enacted, still is, is driven by what it is teachers think um, it, we want the, the students to be able to do. And for an example, one of the projects Margaret and I were involved with, she showed a piece of research from it. We sent out to schools, we were interested in, some of you will know the old stamps problem, which is if you're, you go into the bottom drawer of your desk and you find a, a pile of 5p and 2p stamps, um, and what, what weight, what stamp amounts can you put on packages? and what can't you put on packages. We sent this out to schools and asked teachers to, to, to do this investigation with, with primary school pupils. And what came back told us a lot about the teachers, but it told us very little about the students. Um, because we got some which came back, and we got 30 identical solutions to the problem. Um, and we got others that came back which the students had hardly started working on the problem. The teacher hadn't seen how to scuffle them into finding a way into it. and so. Clearly, the, the teacher's views of, and we'd sent out quite detailed instructions, we thought, about what this was supposed to do, which was to, to, in, to investigate the processes. Um, the teacher's views of what it was that, that they were looking for in the students producing solutions to this investigation varied greatly. And so my, my point, one of my points I'm making is that we really need to work with teachers' understanding of what it means to be a problem solver, what it means to reason mathematically. And we know, we do know that that varies greatly. And the thing, one of the things, of course, that actually influences that greatly is, is the assessment. And so I don't want to go back to the slide, but at the moment I'm kind of hearing in the discussion that this process is, although assessment is, is kind of being nodded at, that the, the assessment is at the moment, the, sorry, the process at the moment is sounding like a forward design from the framework through to the assessment. Um, I'm making a plea for some backward work on looking at the assessments. Um, and in making that plea, and I know we're going to be talking about assessments, but I think it's another thing, another thing I want to flag about some claims about neutrality and that the framework, if you look at the examples we've been given, tends to imply that, that it's kind of assessment neutral, that I can take any assessment and map it onto the framework. And I was heartened by Lynn saying this will have a Cambridge vision, this will be Cambridge mathematics. And so I think I would encourage them to bite the bullet about saying these are the sorts of assessments that we think are quality assessments that help teachers understand what good, rich learning looks like, um, not that you can use this framework to judge any, any assessment. Um, just a couple of things about um, professional development. Um, <coughs> beautiful. Um, this is taken from uh, the OECD Teaching and Learning in Schools study, which is probably less well known, I think, than the, than the PISA study outside this room. I'm sure people here know it. Um, but it's just uh, an indication of the things that teachers report making moderate uh, or high impact and their amount of, of uh, participation in it. So individual and collaborative research um, is reported as having one of the highest impacts but the lowest amount of involvement. Um, uh, whereas um, informal dialogue to produce teaching is designed, is, is reported as, as high professional development and but rather uh, slightly less impact. Um, but down here, education conferences and seminars, quite high, um, but less impact. Um, so it's just raising some issues about the sorts of professional development that uh, teachers themselves say value, and Malcolm, I know, is going to pick up on this. But this is the other, another slide from here, and what this is showing, the upper line, is uh, teachers basically getting together to plan for teaching, and the bottom line is teachers looking at the outcomes of that teaching. As you can see, as teachers spend more time planning what their inputs are, they spend less time planning, looking at the outputs of that. And one of the things that I think the, 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 the research in professional development, again, is showing is that if we get teachers really focused on the outcomes, we can worry less about the inputs if there's an agreement about what it is we want the students to learn. And interestingly, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, just before, and I am going to finish in a minute. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm making a plea that professional development needs to make learning studyable, not necessarily the teaching. Um, and that might come through actual practices like co-observation of each other. Um, lesson study is a, is a very powerful way that that's being explored. Um, but also maybe uh, in an online environment, we can encourage teachers to work with records of practice by looking at student work outcomes, um, the sort of assessments that they're producing for each other, uh, and videos. Um, I haven't read, I don't think it's out yet, the Paul Ernest's new chapter, but I actually, I'm going to go even a bit further back than Margaret went and finish off with um, Alfred North Whitehead on education, writing about it uh, in the 1930s. And he talks about learning going, um, having three components to it. Uh, precision, which I think frameworks can actually do something about precision. They can actually tell you about the content, about the skills. Uh, about generality, which is the processes side of it. But his term, he doesn't talk about um, appreciation, he talks about romance. Um, and I like the idea of engaging teachers in a romantic relationship with mathematics. Um, uh, we could have math.com as, uh, as a contrast to match.com. Um, and so my questions I want to finish on are these three. Um, so I'm saying that I think assessment is one of the powerful ways that views of learning are shaped. Um, I'm reading at the moment that the, new, the, the framework wants to be kind of assessment neutral. Is that a good thing? Um, my second question is, and I think Malcolm's going to say something about this, is what sort of professional development can have learning at its centre and not just a focus on unpacking curriculum statements or, unpack, or looking at styles of pedagogy? And finally, how can we help teachers find the romance in mathematics? Thank you very much indeed. Say again. Say again. Okay. No, how do you do this? How do you switch this forward? Ah, there we go. Right, what, what I'd like to do to start with is, is raise a few questions. What are the purposes and content of professional development? What forms of continuing professional development are most effective? What support resources are necessary and how can it become more scalable? And uh, I think that the first thing I want to say is that um, it's, it, there's a kind of tension between saying we're going to be evidence-based, but we're going to be visionary. Because most evidence is about um, how we've performed poorly in the past. And, and when we're trying to create new things, we won't have the evidence for them. So there's a sense in which we have to gather evidence as we go. And so um, I want to look at what are we actually looking at in professional development with teachers. And um, this raises the list, as it were. We can look at trying to raise teachers' proficiency and understanding of the subject and seeing the big ideas. One of the problems we have with teachers at the moment is that we have such a fragmented, fragmented curriculum. Um, and the teachers say to me, you know, they can't see the wood for the trees. They can't see what the big ideas are, what the big themes are. And also there's this... Are we, are we, trying to give teachers more awareness of the power of maths and how it's used to model the world and solve problems. So the focus of the teacher is broadened and enlarged. But then there's all the sort of pedagogy stuff. <coughs> and focus of PD could be about the curriculum. And I want to say something about the multidimensional goals for learning. It's not just about working your way through topics. How do teachers learn to organise schemes of work, make connections and recognise progress? Do teachers begin to grow in their understanding of how students learn maths and the common obstacles to learning? Do they begin to recognise what the powerful teaching looks like and how they should select tasks, sequence them into something that, that is exciting in the classroom and that furthers the content and process goals together. So um, just to illustrate a little bit of this, <coughs> I'm going to draw on something from uh, a project we've been working on in the US. And uh, in that project, we've been looking at what tools 
and things can we, can we equip teachers with to make sense of some of these things? Alan Schoenfeld in Berkeley <coughs> has come up with a, you don't have to read this by the way, but the, the top line of it is if, we, if, if classrooms are going to become powerful places, you have to pay attention to five dimensions. And this is a tool for thinking about what makes for a powerful classroom. You have to think about the mathematics, the cognitive demand of the mathematics, the access that students have to mathematical content, the agency, authority and identity, you know, what, is everybody taking part in the mathematics and uh, what's their role in that and how you can use assessment formatively in the classroom to, to um, adapt what you're doing to individual learning needs. And so part of the PD is about equipping teachers with the right sort of glasses to look at the curriculum with and get a vision of it. <clears throat> this is a tool that I've been using a lot with teachers in this country. And it's about the working mathematically dimension. Because um, I think in most frameworks, um, and so far this is no exception actually, we start by listing content and then these are tacked on at the end, the, the working mathematically. And what I would like to see is a stronger focus on what the goals are of learning, what student products we would like to see. So um, what kinds of things do we want students to produce at the end of a lesson, say? Um, do we want them to produce, <coughs> for conceptual understanding, they, they might want to classify something, define something. They might want to represent something themselves or analyse something or, or make an argument or make a mathematical model of something, solve a problem or critique somebody else's solution. And then linking that to the kinds of processes that we want to see going on in the classroom. So I use these goals, what products do we want, what tasks do we select towards those goals. And uh, this is zooming in on one of them, this is the modelling line. Um, <clears throat> the final line is breaking down what the processes mean. Um, so formulating models, what does that mean? Identifying good questions, making suitable assumptions, representing a situation, identifying the variables, generating relationships between the variables. And it's actually unpacking that and illustrating it that could be the content, um, uh, a way of integrating content into the uh, working mathematically dimension. <coughs> so what about PD then? Um, effective PD, there's a lot of research evidence on what's effective. Um, there's a lot of problems with actually measuring whether they are effective, but that's another issue. Um, they are usually experiential and they draw on teachers' own experiences as reflective practitioners. They're not something that comes from outside in, in the sense of information. It's about giving teachers experiences. They're, they're sustained. They, they go on over a long period of time and they involve these cycles where teachers plan something together, predict something, enact and reflect. They're grounded, they're very practical, well resourced and they're related specifically to the cultures in which teachers are working. They're safe um, and teachers aren't used to observing each other in safe environments where they feel that they can try something out that might not work and learn from it. Um, they're collaborative, they're informed by outside expertise and linked so that it's not just a group of teachers um, sharing their prejudices and ignorance but, but actually moving on. It's provocative, it, it involves a challenge with support, it's focused on something specific and it attends to the development of the maths. Okay, and this is... Um, this, I think, is quite an important slide. It's from Gusky, but it, it sort of says that most of the time we inform teachers of something and then we say, go and do it. That's not the way people learn. Usually they learn by doing something and then reflecting upon it. Um, it's the reflection stuff, say. So you, you, you start with a professional development. You say, try this out in your classroom. 
it, do, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work, then observe your students and then as a result you might change in your beliefs and attitudes. You don't try and set out by changing beliefs and attitudes. You, people only change themselves as they reflect on their own um, experiences. And there are three different forms of PD I've mostly been involved in. Uh, there's the training models. <coughs> Some expert goes in, does a talk. Um, we might uh, play around with a few ideas and then we go away again. Usually that feels alien to teachers because they haven't been part of it. Um, they're having something done to them. Then there are experiential courses where you have a provider maybe um, and you, you offer teachers opportunities to explore fresh ideas and then come back and say what happens. So they happen over a period of time. And then finally, you have embedded communities where there's ongoing uh, research into their own practice that goes on by small communities over extended periods of time. And uh, this usually teachers are taking over their own responsibility for doing this. And we've been playing around with these things for years now. And uh, I suppose most of the things I've been involved in are experiential courses and embedded professional development communities at the moment. So I just want to talk a little bit about how, we, how this works. So if you're designing a course, say, and we've done this a few times, we usually start by recognising and valuing the context the teacher is working in and try to get them to explain and explore their existing values, beliefs and practices. Then we will provide them with something vividly challenging. It might be through video or it might be through reading something. And this is really different to what they currently do. And th through this challenge, um, we ask them to suspend their belief and try and act in new ways as if they believe differently. And as they do this, we offer support and mentoring um, as they go back into the classroom to try something out. And then they come back together again and it's taken over them by the teachers who reflect on the experiences they've had, the implications that, and, that come out of their experiences and recognise where they've changed and, and talk about where they've changed in their, in their understanding and beliefs and practices. Over the years, we've developed many online resources and practical resources for teachers and put on many workshops of this type. This was one I did in Somerset, where we have a workshop for two days and then teachers go away and try things with colleagues. Then they come back again, share the outcomes. The first half day of each of these events was sharing outcomes of what you've done and what your thoughts and what your learning is. And then there's a new input and then they go away. And so these cycles take on a life of their own and at the end of one of these you almost have a community that could be self-sustaining because they're used to the rhythm of trying new things out but they still need resources from the outside and when we've done analyses of the results of these I've done this about three or four times now in my own research and um, we found that <laughs> this slide is, it needs a bit of explanation but teachers often move from a transmission approach where they have been telling the class everything and, uh, and, and the students have been fairly passive actually. It, they've usually moved in two directions. One is retrograde. Uh, they move towards individual discovery because they say I've been saying everything to these students for so long. What I'll do now is I'll withdraw and let them and let them play with the ideas. I've been saying too much, I withdraw, let them discover stuff. That's worse than the place where they started. The other place is where they move in and they challenge students and work with them to, to work on the knowledge together. And that's a better place, that's more effective. And so often the point is, professional development, um, people take a path and over time they might move from transmission to discovery to collaborative, connectionist. So they might actually get worse before they get better in terms of effect, put crudely. 
And uh, that always, that's one of the problems with evaluating whether it's been successful by lo looking at student outcomes. People take a while to learn new things. Now, an illustration of this kind of model scaled up is happening in Sweden now. And I just want to, if you're English, you'll be bowled over by this. From 2012 to 16, all teachers in Sweden receive government-initiated PD. It's run by the National Agency for Education and the University of Gothenburg. So there's already a government um, national agency university link. 40,000 teachers across 6,000 schools are involved. The teachers have one meeting per week for a year. It's costing 1,875 euros per teacher. 20 different universities have been involved in designing the resources. And they reckon every teacher and school will take part in this. OK, the structure. The teacher collaboration, working on this model, that they come together, they collaborate, is, is supported by web-based materials that have been designed um, by the government and the universities. The teachers meet every week, as I said. Groups of universities work together to produce the content and peer review it. So it's evidence-based because they, they, they've used research in designing it. Teachers work on two modules over a year, and this is what a module is. It's eight cycles of this. They, they study some text, video, and recall their own experiences on their own for an hour. They, they meet in groups and plan lessons together. To do, they, they discuss what they've learned, and they plan lessons. They carry out the lessons, in some cases with peer observation, then they meet together to discuss the outcomes. They have access to an advisor, and they're trained, and then the principals and administrators within the schools who are responsible for planning this um, are also given training. Okay. I think this is a fantastic model. It's an expensive model, but it's, it's being done now. And the last thing I want to say is about embedded professional learning communities. Now, this is, um, this is about getting teachers to form communities which become part of their culture, where they habitually work together and learn from each other. And they may be based in individual schools or clusters of schools. The ones we've been working with recently, there are three schools, three teachers in each school come together and they visit each other's classrooms and they learn together. They're supported by outside inputs. So their links made may be to HE or, or to resources that are online. And these happen over time, over time. The, the best example of this, I suppose, is the Japanese lesson study model, which Mike mentioned briefly, where you start, the teachers identify a research focus. So it might be um, on, on maybe how can we help our students to represent something mathematically more how can we get them to understand how to choose a suitable representation? They plan a research lesson together with input from the expert or, or, or the resources that are online. They teach the lesson and observe each other, and then there's a long analysis of the lesson afterwards, which might take an hour or two. And then they review and revise all their planning and go back and maybe think, what's the next research focus? OK, this is, ha this, is, this is common practice in Japan, particularly with primary schools. And uh, I don't... Uh, they also do public ones. And we're currently exploring how these might take off in the UK with reference to understanding problem solving. That's all I'm going to say, all right? So that, that's just a very quick tour of models of PD. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, both of you. And I'd like to throw the floor open to debate immediately and just pick up on um, really interesting to hear about the different models of PD that work in, in mathematics classrooms from Malcolm. And Mike was talking about how can we make learning the centre 
of PD? What is it that um, allows us to do that? And I just wonder if there is um, any comments, if there are any comments from the floor on how we might achieve those. Um, I'm Tony Bearden. Um, I have uh, two projects that I'm very happy to have made myself redundant from. One was Enrich, and the other I want to say a little bit more about is the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences Schools Enrichment Center, AIMSEC. Now, hello to uh, colleagues out there in South Africa, um, because I have spent the last 12 years of my life working in South Africa with AIMSEC, and I hope that we will AIMSEC will, I mean, talk to um, the group there or some of the group that we have seen on the video link. Because I have to say that what AIMSEC does is uh, almost entirely professional development because what, we found, what I found 12 years ago when I did a feasibility study in South Africa was that the great need there was for professional development. What I wanted to take out to South Africa was something like the Millennium Mass Project and there are elements of that which we have shared across many, many schools in South Africa over the last 12 years. But um, what we found what the greatest need was for professional development. Now, AIMSEC can offer you people just what you're asking for. That is uh, a lot of um, ideas about using um, uh, some of the things you've heard about today. And in particular, the last thing that um, uh, Malcolm mentioned, which it was, uh, it was about communities um, of teachers who together are... Um, developing their own professional development based around ways of learning that are um, the sort of thing you've heard about this morning. And so that's what AIMSEC is doing. So uh, I would like to, uh, having spoken rather too long, sorry, I, I would like to continue this dialogue at a, a later stage with, with many of the people here. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if there were any comments from South Africa um, th that you'd like to pick up on. Perhaps we'll give you a moment's breathing space because I, I think there are some more questions from the floor. I thought I saw a hand going up. Can I ask um, perhaps uh, somebody who is a maths teacher to comment on the sort of professional development that would make the most difference to them? So what we're really aiming for is making the professional development for the Cambridge Maths Framework um, different to better than adding value to all the other kinds of really good professional developments that there are out there, or using those best bits and, and putting them all together. So I think we have Daniel Thompson, is it, from who spoke before, who is a maths teacher, and I have asked him before if I could call on him as a practitioner. Um, for a view from the sharp end. Thank you. One day I'll learn to keep my head down and stop getting <laughs> into these situations, but I never quite seem to manage it. Okay. Um, I think the thing that came across to me as you were both giving your presentations is, um, well, something I knew already. It takes a lot of time to improve your practice. Um, the kind of models and interventions you were talking about sound fantastic. I, I talk with my students all the time about the importance of a, a learning community and a, the safe environment in which you can discuss ideas and it's okay to make mistakes and, you know, just there are no stupid questions. If you're thinking something, throw it out there and, and we'll work with it. And then in my practice, I see a slightly different model. We get observed when it's time to have your lessons rated. Are you an outstanding teacher, a good teacher, or actually do you need improvement? Because if you're not good, you, you need improvement. There's no one, two, three, four. You're either a one or two or in trouble. Um, and I think if I went to my leadership team and said, I would love to start uh, an academic community in the school looking at maths teaching and ideally I'd like to talk to other schools in Cambridge, they'd say, great Dan, you do that in the evening when you're not teaching. 
Um, so whilst I'm on board, I can see the issue being getting the leadership teams. There's probably a principal in here now who's going to stand up and say, I would love to do that. It sounds great. Um, and it does sound great. I think this idea of an academic community is absolutely key. Um, and some of it is about modelling to our students the process of education. I never want to stop learning about mathematics, about teaching, about anything else. I hope I can encourage my students to share that passion for learning, even if it's not maths. Um, it's difficult for me to model that academic community with the current time pressure. Um, the other thing I loved was your, your in concentric circles embedded curriculum. I think we absolutely start with this idea of this is what we intend, this is what you're going to teach, this is what they're going to get at the end of it. And, and that seems so obvious now you've said it that it's limited. Um, I also like the idea that what policymakers intend I teach is slightly less than what I do teach. And I'm hopefully stretching that boundary and not just teaching to a test. And again, we're going to start talking about time pressure there. Um, but Oh, sorry, I'm going on too long. I'll give it back. Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, uh, aware that South Africa would like to come into the conversation. And having invited them, I think um, it would be good to hear what they say. Absolutely. So, I'm, I'm happy to sit uh, back down. Hello, Johannesburg. Hey. Hello there. Um, yeah, uh, as a head of maths of a, of a, a department of 15, I, I, I consider it my responsibility to, to take care of the professional development of the teachers in my department. And, um, you know, I have a variety of experience and expertise. And um, it's quite difficult to, you know, in the hours of the school day to... to um, devote time to visiting classrooms and that kind of thing. But I think that that is basically where, where it starts. I think that firstly, you, you need um, more experienced teachers to be visiting the classes of less experienced teachers, offering advice, um, also co-teaching. And the other thing that experienced teachers should be doing is teaching the class of less experienced teachers so that they can actually observe um, those kind of things in action. And I think that the, the whole professional development thing ideas should be ongoing throughout the year. It shouldn't be sort of uh, when you think it, it's necessary. And also what schools tend to do is um, often this kind of thing boils down almost to an evaluation, a sort of a tick box, how are you doing, rather than hands on how do I get better. And um, I think that you know we, we've got to keep it real down to earth um, professional development. And there's got to be buy in from all the teachers that they actually want to, to get better. So, um, yeah, and, and I, I, having been to sort of various um, workshops and seminars, you know, sometimes, uh, as one of the speakers alluded to, th those kind of things can be a little bit abstract. Um, and you go away thinking, yes, that was a good idea, but never really implementing it. So that's why it really boils down to the schools themselves to be um, implementing the kind of professional development that, that uh, teachers need. Some interesting perspectives there from both the classroom and um, uh, from the leadership team. Lots of nodding and, 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 yes. and shaking of heads amongst these three people here. Which this lady there, I can put you on the spot. You seem to you you, you had a view. You had a view. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, Alison Borthwick, Norfolk, LA. I think the thing that I want to say is that. In order to be successful at professional development, you've got to want it in the first place. And I think a lot of teachers don't know what it is they need for professional development. And I'm not sure that individual schools are necessarily the best placed organisations to do that as well. So that's why I was nodding. Okay. Right, thank you. And at the, the back there? Yes, John Westwell from NCTM. Um, I think you posed the question, what added value might Cambridge Mathematics bring to professional development? We, you know, we're, there, there are two sides to this. We're hearing a bit about the working practices within schools and how teachers learn together. And, and there's a whole domain around that that we would want to encourage. But that might be a little bit more difficult for Cambridge Mathematics to kind of influence. I think 
the kind of things that would be strong value added is the stimulus and resources. We, 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 we talk a lot about expertise and where it's located. Um, we, we can make that available more these days um, through online interaction. So I think it's the, the, the kind of resources. So it's both connecting people to researchers and their, and their thinking, but picking up on Mike's point, one of the most powerful things that you can sh um, put in front of teachers is to look at learning. And, and, and vid just high quality video material either of, of classrooms and, and what's happening in terms of teaching, or more at the sort of interview level with youngsters talking about mathematics uh, can be incredibly stimulating resources for professional development. But they're also quite expensive to make, and, and a, a concerted effort on that would be a resource internationally then um, that teachers can interact with. Pe people need, then need to know how to interact with them and, and the frameworks for that, but the, the, the difficult piece is putting those resources together. Yes, of course. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, it's interesting this, because we've got a few issues have been raised. We're, we're going, we've got a meeting in California in a month's time where we've got together um, teachers, um, state supervisors, and also uh, sort of, if you like, heads of schools together. And we're going to try and look at what, what tools and processes we could put in place to make professional development work. And it seems to me that some of the tools you might not expect, that they're things like, um, what could you give to a head teacher who was visiting your classroom to show you what a good lesson looks like from a mathematical point of view? May not know anything about maths. So it might be a letter to, to, to parents saying something about how the curriculum might be changing. There might be artifacts that are quite different from, from uh, you know, just your normal, this is what a classroom looks like. And also, um, another thing that is helping teachers plan together. I think that one of the things that's often missed out in PD is actually sitting with somebody, planning a lesson together, so you get into the thought processes of the experienced colleague or, 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 or more expert. And then you've shared the lessons. So you're not one inspecting the other. You're actually sharing responsibility for that lesson. And at the end of it, you're discussing as peers how we might improve that. So, sorry. I well, does, does, does that answer this lady's question then? <laughs> um, because she's saying you don't, uh, sometimes you just don't know what kind of help. You, you may well say, say to yourself, I want to improve but you've got a million videos and you've got a million potential courses to go yeah, on. How, how do you do the choices? So you think that getting, getting the teachers all together themselves, they could actually inform each other about what, what they might need? It, they do need the external input as well, because if it's just the group of teachers, you can, I'm going to put this very rudely, but you can just recycle ignorance, but you know what I mean. Um, you do need something from outside or, or some link with HE to actually, um, or somebody you can call on. And can I, yes. can I pick up, I, I, I'm, I completely agree with, with what was said about the videos and what Malcolm was saying, but I, want, I, I think there's, there's more, there's still other elements that we need to put in place. So we know that teachers can plan together and the way the lessons are enacted are very different. And so even if they've agreed what they think the learning outcomes are going to be, they can look very different. And so it's how you, it's back to the, the community idea and how you, I think the videos can act as the stimulus that Malcolm was talking about. I've worked with teachers with videos and often what you get is, oh, well, that's all very well for those kids, but it won't work with my kids. And so you've got to do that thing of, of go in and try it. And I think one of the things we've, we've not really bitten the bullet with are what are the non-negotiables? When I'm saying go back and do something, what are the things I'm saying, don't use your creativity to change this. I've worked with teachers where we've worked on fabulous mathematical activities and they've gone back and they've changed a bit of it because they think, oh, my kids would be more interested in this than this. And it actually loses the mathematics. So it's a very delicate balance that I think we have to find between valuing the professionalism but also saying, actually, we know if you do it this way, it'll be better. Yes. University of Eindhoven, Netherlands. Um, 
I think um, this question is very interesting in terms of um, what do we want teachers to develop into? And, and who recognizes this, this professional development? From what um, Malcolm said, it's very clear that, for example, Sweden has gone a particular way and is recognizing it. I know in Norway they have gone a very similar way and every teacher has to do professional <coughs> development, so much professional development. But that doesn't still say something about the sort of aim and, and how do we want teachers to develop. I know that uh, Malcolm knows we can talk about uh, developing questioning and so on, but the general gist, uh, which would go into a framework, for example, if you go to Shanghai, they know what an expert teacher is. They have a particular, this notion of expert teacher, for example, I'm not trying to introduce it into Europe, but when I look around Europe, we don't have such a clear notion about it. Now, should we have it? I don't know. But still, when we think of professional development and what teachers, what we want to do with teachers to go a particular way, I think we need to know what we want them to develop into. And, as I said, that it's recognized countrywide or also as something valuable in terms of their career. I'm, I'm, excuse me a minute, I'm being told there's some comments. Oh, there they are. I was just about to say no, I don't have comments on my uh, monitor. So a couple of things that we might find interesting on Twitter. Do teachers, schools always really know what CPD they need? Which I think picks up very nicely, Alison, with what uh, you were saying. Um, and something about, um, haven't yet said how the framework fits with the national curriculum. Uh, which I think is an interesting point because the framework is aiming, where are you, Lynn, is aiming to, um, to be helpful to national, national curricula, not only in this country, but also in others. This is, it, it, there is an international vision to this. There is. I mean, I, I think one of the rather refreshing things is that the national curriculum is done and dusted for the next five years, so we're not going to be able to affect it, so we shouldn't even try. Um, and it gives us that space to have something which is really worth looking at in five years' time. So we hope that the UK government will be able to look at what we've done and say, gosh, what an awful lot of work has been done um, by Cambridge University and Associates. Um, it's evidence-based, it's integrated, it's coherent. Why wouldn't they want to look at something? Um, whereas we know that at the moment uh, we have a curriculum which um, has lots of strengths about it. I would say that because I was involved with it. On the other hand, there are lots of weaknesses too. And a lot of those weaknesses were because of the process which was um, extremely speedy. Um, so uh, it's not intended, the framework is not intended to support the national curriculum in the UK any more than it's intended to support the national curricula everywhere. I wonder if I could just take this opportunity because we're, um, I'm being told by, uh, uh, in my earpiece that lunch is coming up and I wonder if I could bring together Egypt who I'm told we can't see um, but I would be uh, interested in their views on and Tim Oates who is sitting here in the audience, um, the role of textbooks in professional development and Tim I wonder if we could start with you. Uh, and just give us, uh, because you've done research on, he needs a microphone, I wonder if someone, thank you Tony. Thanks so much indeed Helen. Tim Oates, um, ARD Group Director of Assessment, Research and Development at uh, Cambridge Assessment. Um, yes, we've obviously published recently on the importance of textbooks and by textbooks we don't just mean things from the 1950s, we mean teacher handbooks, student workbooks and so on, so complex materials designed to support teaching. I was very interested when you mentioned the, the, what's going on in Sweden at the moment. Um, and both of you mentioned the importance of what you have to put into the processes of, of teacher co-construction of new approaches. Um, Sweden knows it's in trouble and it's looked at its performance and its restructuring of the nature of education and it knows it has to do something. What's interesting is that when you look at Sweden, Finland, Massachusetts, Alberta, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, they have interesting processes of drawing out from practice, uh, using criteria to identify what constitutes good practice, often using quite elaborate theory to do that, 
in respect of mathematics education, distilling those things into instruments and materials but that can be disseminated from the centre. Now, now, we attempted to do that through the strategies you know, in, in, in uh, both mathematics and in literacy. And they became very, very Dirigis top-down programmes, uh, which were incredibly highly programmed and undermined teacher professionalism. That was the, the, uh, the I think, the top-line finding from Fullen and other studies. When we look at textbooks, what we find around the world is they play a very interesting mediating role in, in extracting from good practice, going through processes of approval and scrutiny, and then feeding back out into classroom practice. And I do think, I mean, we've, Cambridge has published to say that we feel that, that in England we have lost a grip on the extent to which some of these materials elsewhere around the world are of an extraordinarily high standard. They're extremely innovative. They draw on extremely well-derived theory in respect of the sequencing and content of pedagogy and are an instrument by which you can effectively condition classroom practice in a highly beneficial way. Tim. I wonder if we um, have any can comments. I, can I yes. Um, I, I'd like to, okay. Can I just say I'd like to go to Egypt on that one, if, if that's possible, if the technology allows. But Mike, do go first. I, 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 wanna, I, I, wanna, I just want to agree with what Sorry. Tim is saying, but just within the context of the, my understanding of those nations is there's a long history of incremental changes to the curriculum and incremental changes to the textbook, so there's not the history we've got here of publishers having to suddenly create a totally new textbook to go with a totally new curriculum. So we, we have to have some sustained growth over time, which of course is a, a really good argument for why this is a five-year project if you need your VC convincing even more. <laughs> okay, let's go to um, Egypt, and I think we have audio only from them. Hello, can you hear us? Hi, Ro. Yes, I can hear you. Lovely. You, you are the one changing the control. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Comment. Okay. Uh, this is Iman. Uh, well, uh, talking about the uh, professional development, we do he uh, receive here in Egypt uh, lots of professional development uh, sessions from Cambridge, and it affected our uh, our uh, way of teaching a great deal. And for the for the past three years. We can see that lots of our students, or as my colleague has said, uh, about 50% of students take the mathematics as a subject, and because of the development that are happening, or the PD that's happening, that giving out of, by Cambridge, uh, we really uh, score uh, lots, uh, great scores, and many of our students, because our teachers benefited a lot from those uh, uh, PD classes, uh, helped uh, the students to get the uh, great scores, but what's coming uh, for the for what's coming up for the next couple of years? We'd like to see other d different types of PD in the sessions. As by the way, it started to be for me as a math teacher, same kind of PD. So we would like to see for the coming years some changes in in, in the session itself. Uh, in how do we? Prove ourselves more and more by by joining your PD classes. Thank you. Okay, so a comment there about how to keep PD fresh um, and ongoing, and presumably moving with the times. Um, yeah, we have a comment there from oh Henry. I'm not. Um, I'm Henry Peterson. I'm not sure whether this is helpful at this point because the debate has moved on a bit. But I was um, speaking to Hun Sin last night, who's here from the Singapore assessment body and it was very interesting to learn from her that they um, they offer a hundred hours per annum of PD to their teachers for which the government paid so I thought she may have some interesting insights that she could share with us in terms of how do they do that and how do, do they yeah. balance the the time pressures with um, you know the, the value that that's adding to teachers go to South Africa if I may now because it's coming up to lunchtime. Um, always, always um, a good aim to get to and I understand we have a question from South Africa and then perhaps some closing comments from you. Uh, yes, thank you Helen. Um, it's actually a, a more a comment from myself um, uh, from a question passed to me from my the teacher to my left. Um, 
from the debate that Malcolm uh, Swan and, and has mentioned and, and further discussions, it seems to me that we are missing an open goal here and that Cambridge International Examination Zone professional teacher qualifications, which we've just rolled out, accredited um, for f further and higher education qualifications uh, by the University of London, are exactly in the terms of description what we are looking to do in terms of professional development. The modules reflect very much the best practice that Malcolm mentioned. Um, are we not going to be using these uh, in this context? Thank you. It's always good to have an advert, isn't it, on uh, occasions like this. So I recommend you to the website. Uh, Mark, do you have any closing comments before I go to Egypt for their closing comments? I'd just be interested to know if, uh, um, what, what your views are on what you've heard this morning. I'll put that to the group, Helen. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd just like to say how, how valuable it has been. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, um, meeting with people from the international community, and um, I think we've all got a lot out of it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Did you have a quick comment? One, one more, Mike, uh, please. Andrew. Yes, I, I also would like to second uh, that opinion. I have actually learned a lot especially on professional development. I think teaching at the end, I always want to think of the student. We haven't talked about it in, in as my way do we stand in professional development vis-a-vis -vis our students. Mm. So I think a relationship with your students motivates them a lot. There must be a connection. We can know everything, but if there is no motivational connection, you're actually disconnected, even if you have the best of knowledge. So let's strive to create a motivational relationship with our students. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is it possible to go to um, uh, Cairo now for their closing remarks? Hello, Michael. Can you hear us? Well, I don't... Yes, Helen. I don't know if you can see us, but I'm sure you can hear us. Yes, um, I've been talking to um, I've been talking to our Egyptian teachers here uh, before the event and during the break uh, and a little dur during the discussion and I know there's a great sense here that this is really just a beginning. It's been a very stimulating presentation of this huge ambition to build a Cambridge Maths framework in five years, and I know I speak for for our Egyptian friends when. I say that what we really want to know is that we can play our part over the next five years. Um, we want to know what's going on. We want to feed back into it. We want to make sure at the end of the five years we have something relevant to the needs of schools in Egypt and elsewhere. So everyone's really looking forward to pitching in, uh, which I think will be through online contributions and future events. There's a great sense this is the beginning of a great joint enterprise. And thanks for including Cairo. Thank you, Michael, thank you. So before we go to lunch, I just want, would like to ask anybody here if they have any closing remarks that they'd like to make. Um, and also Malcolm and Mike, before I round up. Partly addressing Alison's problem and some remarks of, of Malcolm. Um, is the school the basic unit? I've had the privilege of the last two or three years of applying for PGCE courses and seeing the tension between university input and school direct. And I would welcome comments on, stronger comments on what Malcolm said, that discussion among teachers is fine, but it can become sort of self-serving and go around in circles without some higher, stronger external input. Is there any other country that is trying to remove uh, professional development, initial and subsequent, to some extent, to a large extent, from universities? <laughs> Mark, do you want to comment on how, perhaps just to keep... Um, I was struck by how involved, um, say, Sweden were in working with universities to de devise the content of the professional development. The fact that universities were getting together, 20 universities getting together and, and peer reviewing the content, I thought that was fantastic. 
And in, in Japan, when they do lesson study, they, they invite people to come and take part in those. So they've got some external input. So it's in the culture there. And I would love it to be in the culture here so that, you know, the schools can call on people. But what we need is a, a body of such people who are, who are willing to and, and able to, to sort of study with the school and draw their attention to things that will move their thinking on. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the roles of this, is to find a body of such people and re resource them sufficiently to be able to do that. Uh, I think we have uh, two more hands. About the, um, the involvement of, uh, of higher education. I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I am involved with a, a group of um, national PD providers in Europe, uh, and we meet every so often. And um, without exception, all of them, the National Centres for Professional Development for Mathematics are totally aligned with university input. And we seem to be the exception. Yeah. Thank you. And the last, very last, you have 30 seconds only, and then lunch. Um, I'll try and not ramble. I don't make any promises. Um, I think a comment was made earlier about the more experienced teacher and the less experienced teacher. And I think that that's only one model. Um, I think that you can have teachers of equal experience working together on a project. The key which I think everybody is coming back to is this outside influence. Um, the relationship with HE, with the educational researchers who are looking at the pedagogical approach, um, with the academic mathematicians. You know, I want to be able to say to my students, this topic is leading in this direction. This is current mathematical research and practice. This is the direction in which you can go. Um, I would like my practice informed by current educational research and I would like the application and the scenarios with which we do our learning in to be influenced by industry. If the CPD that the framework is putting together can bring these three inputs to me, I will be a very happy teacher, provided my leadership team give me time. Thank you. Can we just say goodbye to uh, South Africa and Cairo formally before um, we go uh, for our break and say it's been delightful to have you with us. Um, a perspective from different countries is always really useful. Uh, so thank you so much for giving us your time and your presence. Um, and although we haven't been able to see Cairo the whole time, it's been lovely to have you both with us. So thank you and goodbye. Good. Well, then it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Mike and Malcolm for um, setting out such sort of visions for us to go away and think about on how we can make professional development better and integrate it into the maths, the Cambridge Maths Framework. So thank you very much. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs>